I want to go a little bit back to your dear husband. Mm -hmm. He actually was the icon of Chinese Australian. No, here. yes, well, actually, it's his story is very unusual mm. because he is from Shanghai, and yes. when he first came here. He was the only person who spoke Mandarin. Everyone spoke Cantonese. Mm. So he couldn't make friends with anybody because he couldn't talk to them. No. And so even I couldn't talk properly to him. <laughs> he actually came here mm. in, under very unusual circumstances. Yes. Because even though he's married to me and I'm an Australian born yeah. here and I'm a third generation or second or third generation yes. Australian, he couldn't come here as my husband. Mm -hmm. He wasn't allowed to come as my husband. So that was the immigration rules of those days. And uh -huh. it was very, it was a white Australia policy. Mm. So they didn't want more Chinese to come. Uh -huh. So he was only able to come under special arrangement as a business migrant. Okay. And Early business migrant. The first, well, not maybe not, I don't know whether he's the first or not, but he came as a business migrant. And that was mm -hmm. under special um, permission by... Arthur Corwell, who was really? the Minister for Immigration. Wow. And it was because of Mr. Corwell that my husband came here. So we were just lucky that he was able to be a good businessman because yeah. there were, the condition was that he had to uh, import at least 500 pounds per year. Wow, that and was a he, lot. That was a lot of money. Time. Yeah, but and maybe a hundred or more thousand dollars today. If he didn't reach that target, uh -huh. he would have to leave. Even wow. though he's married to me and our children were born here. And for 14, 15 years, that was the rule. How did he cope with that? It didn't worry him because he, he, those things are small things to him. <laughs> it's small things to well, him. Well, big things for him. <laughs> big things is uh, keeping your head above water, I suppose. Yes, yes. <laughs> but he was lucky. Yeah. He, he was just born a good businessman. Yeah. So that was just lucky. Yeah. Um, after a little while, he um, thought, oh, he's doing well in business and uh, he wanted, well actually we knew a lot of people, he got to know a lot of well-known people in, yes. in Melbourne and uh, many of them said to him, why don't you try and do something extra, Exciting. extra, you know. Yes. So he was asked by friends mm -hmm. and the people he knew to try for the Melbourne City Council mm. and uh, so he stood for that, in yes. the, for the Gibbs Ward which is Chinatown, yes. covers Chinatown. Yes. And we had a, he organised a great campaign. He's mm -hmm. a great organiser of campaigns. He was very good at organising and yes. very good at very detailed things. So we did everything. We even sealed all the envelopes, wrote all the things, put them in the letterboxes, rang everybody up, the whole family, all the people we knew <laughs> helped and us. And he got in, he won, he was elected. Yeah. It was elected by the people. So when was that? That was 69, he was elected to the Melbourne City Council. It is extraordinary. Annex 65 yeah. was just the end of this, just four, year, four years before yeah. the end of the White Australia policy. So besides Chinese, it will be one of the Asian migrant well, who has been... Yes, probably, the, because there, there were other Chinese. There was mm -hmm. a mayor, Chinese mayor in Darwin, uh -huh. but he was born here. But yes. my husband was the first migrant. one, a migrant yes. here. So, and then since Fantastic. then, there, since then, there are many migrants yes. are now, you know, local and and federal politics. How did he cope with limited English to make speech to the public? Did very well. First of all, yes. in the beginning, I, I, he asked me to teach him English. That's how I got to know him. Oh, so your wife and a teacher? <laughs> no, because well, he's a person who's he's a great opportunist. Uh -huh. Whatever, wherever the opportunity is, he would grab, grab, one, it. grab yes. it. So he grabbed me to teach him English you uh -huh. see, for nothing, <laughs> for free. <laughs> So that was, you, you met? We met here. Yeah. Here. Mm. Oh, I see. Anyway, so he, because, but with his English, he actually had a teacher come every week. The whole time mm. he was here, he had a teacher come twice a week. But he never, ever got it that well that he was comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. But so he always practised his speeches. He wrote very good speeches. Yes. And he spoke very well. It became the... You know, the representative of people. Yeah, he, but he In actually, a completely English speaking country. <laughs> he was one of those people, just yeah. had to challenge whatever was in front of him. Fantastic. Yeah. This is presented to me after my husband died. 
uh, and it was signed by the Lord Mayor of Melbourne of the day and the town clerk. Just a treasure like uh, the oh, right. or ornament. It's yeah, treasure okay. of our culture, the people, the <laughs> yeah. thought, the uh, contribution to the country. That is the broad, you know, interpretation of the treasures. And the children, mm -hmm. the children all follow the the fathers and mothers' examples. Well, my eldest son. Yeah. Uh, joined us in the business. Mm -hmm. Oh, two boys joined us in the business. Yes. Christopher yes. and Mark. Yeah. They're both in the business. And then uh, I think that Mark was a painter, actually. He was a beautiful painter. Uh -huh. And when he graduated from the National Gallery, yes. uh, he um, wanted to be, a, be an artist. Uh -huh. But my husband said, why don't you try a couple of years in the business and see how you go. Uh -huh. So Mark was there for two years yes. and in that two years my husband died. Mm -hmm. So Mark was stuck there in the business, never became a painter. <laughs> so I don't know whether he regrets it today, but anyway. <laughs> and he also inherited Father's spirit to engage in dialogue. Yes, well, he, he's a, in that way he's a very creative, so he's done a lot in the Chinese Museum yes. because uh, he's very good at in decoration and, mm -hmm. and programs for cultural pro pro programs for the yes. museum. And in that way he's very good, so his creativity has gone that way instead of to his painting. Yeah. <laughs> and he's still engaged you know, heavily into the Chinese Museum. Oh, yes. Daily work, I it? think that the pro all the programs are mostly his doing. Bringing dragons to Melbourne is quite a historic thing because when we made the dra its father, uh, no one had actually uh, made a dragon for 30 years in China. So uh, just uh, straight after the Cultural Revolution, uh, we actually had to take the dragon parts back and actually uh, show them how to make a dragon. So we, we, we had to reinvent dragon making in China. I remember the last year, and uh, he brought Chinese Museum to Tianjin City. Yes. As a Melbourne sister mm -hmm. city's 30 year sister city relationship celebration. Right, yeah. So and I think just last, I think this year, uh, there was something to do with Australian um, at the, in Shanghai, the Australian uh -huh. Pavilion. I think he yes. did something there too. Mm. And also the, uh, that's right. Mm. The, um, the Shanghai Expo. That's right, yeah. He helped with that yes. pavilion, yeah. So he's also very global. <laughs> and to, to maintain the mm. Chinese culture as part of global That's right. culture, yeah. especially and then Australia's the, and culture. And then my oldest son, Chris, he was the, the businessman, so he carried on after my husband died. Yeah. And he was good at that. <laughs> 